Welcome everyone. Today uh, we're going to be looking at the question of why God allows suffering. Now that question of why, why does God allow suffering is not merely a philosophical question, it's an issue which demands uh, not only an answer as to why God allows suffering, but also a solution to that very real problem. So, for example, an astrophysicist uh, might ask uh, quite rightly the question of why black holes might exist at the centre of galaxies, or a philosopher or a physician might ask the question, why do we dream? But the, these are questions of explanation. They're not so much issues looking for a solution. So no astrophysicist is looking uh, for a solution to the problem of a black hole at the centre of our galaxy. But the question of suffering is a little different. Yes, it, it's reasonable to ask that question, why does God allow suffering? But this also begs surely a second question. If God does allow suffering, has he done something about it? I think it's highly significant to reflect that, that human beings ask this question at all. If God doesn't exist, then why does it seem that the human brain is almost hardwired to, to ask of an all-powerful being like God why suffering exists? There seems to be something fundamental to the human condition uh, that we imagine an all-powerful creator, a God, and, and we even apply some expectation of a moral compass to that creator God figure. You see, there's no rule that says that uh, if God exists, then he should have a either any interest in us at all or B, is under some kind of compulsion to act in our best interests. Just like uh, any dictator, the mere fact of God's hostility uh, towards us would not undermine his existence. A dictator like Joseph Stalin doesn't cease to exist just because we don't like what he did. But can Christianity offer something more than that? Well, I say yes. Christianity is rooted in the issue of suffering. The Christian Bible is filled with stories of suffering, murder, slavery, plagues, childlessness, death and every other kind of human suffering are laid open with honesty in the pages of the Bible. The Bible is refreshingly honest about the problem of suffering. The Bible isn't an escapist book about God, but it's a book about the actions and character of God in the heart of suffering in the world. The Bible does uh, provide a uh, an answer to, the, to that first question of why God allows suffering. Why is there suffering in the world? It gives the reason for that suffering being our rejection of him. That human desire to ignore God and to set ourselves up as little gods of our own lives. And that has led to the problem of the whole of creation being in some way hostile towards us uh, and us to each other. As God put it uh, in the Garden of Eden, this is from Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 and 23. The Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and live forever. So the Lord God banished man from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And the early chapters of the Bible, principally Genesis chapters 1 to 11, with the accounts of the, the murder of Cain, 
by murder of Abel by his brother Cain, uh, stories of Noah and the flood and the Tower of Babel, these set out the problem that without God's intervention, humanity is doomed to experience suffering and death. Well, that's just the first 11 chapters, but the overwhelming thrust of the Christian Bible is not about providing an answer to the philosophical question of why God uh, allows suffering, but it addresses that second, perhaps more important question, has God done anything about it? Now, to illustrate what I mean, I, I want us to imagine um, a geologist and a civil engineer standing on one bank of a huge raging river and looking across to the other side. Now, the geologist can provide us with uh, an answer to the question, why is there a river here? Why is that river here stopping us from getting to the place of plenty on the other bank on the opposite side? The geologist might tell us about glacial or, or seismic activity over millions of years and explain the reason for the river. Now, the civil engineer might find some of that information uh, from the geologist helpful, but the geologist will not be able to build a bridge or any means of getting us from this bank to the better bank on the other side. But the civil engineer can build a bridge which will eventually bring us to the place of plenty on the opposite bank. Now in this illustration of um, the geologist and uh, the civil engineer and the river, the river is the problem of sin and suffering. The geologist is, is like the philosopher, simply attempting to answer the question of why God allows suffering. But the civil engineer is like the God of Christianity himself, who provides a solution to the problem of the raging torrent. When it comes to the question of suffering, the, the, the Christian claim is that God has himself acted to deal with the problem. He has acted in power, in history, and within the context of human suffering, within the context of his own creation. To utterly reverse the problem of sin, death and suffering, God is like the civil engineer who has solved the problem. And so this, therefore, is the uniquely Christian claim. The Bible shows us that control over creation, which has become hostile to us, whether in flood, war, coronavirus or anything else, that control is restored through Jesus Christ. As the Jesus disciples said of him when he calmed the, the storm, which would otherwise have drowned them on uh, the Sea of Galilee, they said, even the wind and the waves obey him. Control over creation is restored in Jesus Christ. Second, the Bible shows us that the relationship which we lost with God in Eden is restored through Jesus Christ. As Paul says in his letter to uh, the Romans about our receiving of the spirit of Jesus Christ through faith, he writes, the spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So relationship, as well as control over creation, relationship with God is restored in Jesus Christ. And thirdly, the eternal life, which was replaced by death 
at Eden is restored through Jesus Christ, as the uh, Apostle John says in his first letter. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So eternal life is restored in Jesus Christ. And all of this reveals to us something about the character of God, because it's not through uh, a distant act by God, the waving of some hand, uh, that everything we lost in Eden is restored. No, it's through the earthly, real, historical, loving act of God himself being crucified among us. God's very own suffering, that our suffering is guaranteed to come to an end. And I would say that r rather than simply ask the question, why does God allow suffering? It's better to focus on the good news that God has done something about suffering. As we read at the end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, God will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. The Bible makes no bones about the reality of suffering, but it speaks of a God who loves his lost people and came to suffer himself so that we might be rescued. Belief in, G belief in Jesus Christ does not mean that uh, suffering ends now. Far from it. Jesus was very clear that suffering will continue for a time. But Jesus has acted to bring an end to it. For the Christian, suffering doesn't cease any more than it does for anybody else, but it does put suffering into context. In 40 years as a Christian, I've only encountered uh, a tiny handful of people whose faith fell apart when suffering came. What I have encountered far more commonly is people whose faith falls apart when wealth and plenty come their way. When it becomes very easy to forget God and his provision. Rather than people have their faith collapse through periods of suffering. The overwhelmingly more common testimony, including my own and countless millions across history uh, and across the world, is that believers' faith in Jesus Christ is actually built up through suffering far more than it is through times of plenty. I want to finish by acknowledging that we will never fully understand the mind and the purposes of God this side of glory. But perhaps at least in part, for that reason, God may allow um, suffering con to continue for a while in as much as it calls us to turn to him and to put our faith in his son, Jesus. As many uh, have observed in one way or another over the centuries, there are no atheists in the trenches. Thank you for watching.